phase two much faster. The disadvantage of phase two is there's an error introduced because I have these tallies from phase one, but they don't fully account for a lot of the correlations in all those variables. Because it doesn't account for those correlations, you do get about a two to three percent error in the energy density uh, from a phase two calculation. But I don't mind that too much because there's a lot of experimental errors that are way lower than two to three percent. So that kind of goes into the noise. So here's my Mercury model of the holder. Uh, I did this in CG. So this is what I actually throw into the calculation. I have all the foils. You can see all the different foil types there for one of my experiments. Because Mercury has this Python interface, which is really nice, uh, I use the Python interface to read a CSV file of every single foil we have, which could be up to 168 foils. It populates the foils in the simulation. It creates every single tally for those foils. And then when the simulation is over, it uses the tally information and the experimental data to then renormalize the problem. So when my answer comes out, I don't have to touch it. It's fully normalized correctly to the experimental data. So this is what I throw into the simulation, at least for the square plate. This is kind of what I get out, which is what I care about, the energy density. So here on the left is a plot of the energy density on this, on this plate in units of energy per centimeter cubed. If I slice it along the side, this is what you see in that plate. So it heats up a lot on the edges, not as much on the inside. And if I just do a simple conversion to a temperaturized, adiabatic temperaturized at V4C, you see a very high number. So you see, it's maybe hard to read. This is saying 750 degree temperature rise. Uh, that's not what you will normally see. This is assuming that all the energy is deposited immediately. And that's not the case. The pulse actually has a shape to it. And you have diffusion into the center. So you, you don't see that kind of temperature rise. It's a, it's a good, very conservative estimate if you want to know how hot your sample is going to be. So when you tell the reactor operators, it's not going to get hotter than this temperature. Um, they, they have an idea. What you really need to do is then couple this into Diablo and see what the temperature looks like, which is what I did here for a really preliminary Diablo simulation. You see the pulse heats up the plate immediately, and then what you start to see is as the heat moves into the aluminum holder, you start seeing it move over. There's actually an asymmetry in how it's clamped down, which is why it's moving to one side versus the other. And here, the peak temperature was only about 150 Celsius. So the adiabatic temperature center is going up to 750. Simulation is saying it's only going up to about 150. So it's a huge difference when you actually start accounting for thermal diffusion and the pulse shape of that heating. And it cools down fairly quickly. It gets back to the ambient temperature, at least in these, in these experiments, within five minutes. Okay, so here's some data, actually. I like this data a lot. So it looks really nice. There's no odd features in the thermocouples. Uh, you may not see it here. Uh, the only odd feature we've seen in the data at the start was a very quick jump in the thermocouples right when the pulse was happening. Uh, that, I think, is likely due to the gamma rays within the wire. Uh, but it quickly goes back down, and then you get this kind of normal temperature rise in this case, up to about 140 degrees. You see differences in the thermocouple response between the spring-loaded thermocouples, the solid lines, and the down lines, which are the adhesives. The adhesives systematically get to a better, a higher temperature in the spring-loaded. Um, I, I think they have better contact conductance with the adhesives, where you're pressing down the wire itself onto the sample. The spring-loaded, you actually have the thermocouple bimetals in this little cup that touches the surface, and we don't think there's actually a good connection between those leads, those thermocouple leads, and that cup, which is why it doesn't get to a higher temperature. If you look at the later time, you see pretty consistent behavior. All goes down to roughly the same temperature, which is good. It's matching the aluminum temperature, so everything's equilibrating. Uh, we were really happy. These are the first set of uh, data we got because there have been issues with thermocouples at this lab where they sometimes cut out or they stop working or they just come off the sample. So the fact that we got data all the way through was really exciting for this first experiment. Now, of course, I need to compare what I got here to some simulations with Diablo. So here are some very preliminary simulations with Diablo. Diablo is now the dotted lines compared to the data, which is the solid line. 
you can see that Diablo is much higher. It's at a higher peak temperature. It's a little bit higher over here in the middle, and then it goes lower than the measured temperature at the end. So let me kind of go over these three areas to give you an idea of what I think is happening. This is the easiest to fix. So it's going to a lower temperature than what was measured. This, I believe, is likely to the fact that the cavity itself is heating up during the pulse. It heats up by about three to four degrees. I'm not accounting for that in the simulation. That's pretty much what that difference is right there. Um, the middle section, so I believe I can correct this with the thermal structural simulation. So right now, this is a thermal only simulation. I'm not doing any of the movement of the materials. When you include thermal structural, as the materials expand and start pushing against the, other, the aluminum holder, you get higher conductance, which should bring this down as it conducts heat away from the aluminum a little bit better. And then the peak is off. That's a little bit trickier. So that I need to look at how well we are um, normalizing the data to the activation foils. I need to make sure that's correct. And I can play around a bit with the contact conductance. The issue right now with the contact conductance is we need to, like I say down here, tabletop measurements to actually measure it. Right now in the code, it's a knob. And it's a knob I don't want to use. I'd rather use experimental data because it's a very big knob. Kind of contact conductance in the code can be anywhere between 0 and 10 million. It's a huge range to pick a number from. So I need to figure this out a little bit better. But right now, for first cut, 10% off, I thought was really good for this. If I compare it to the adhesives, you see a similar effect to the adhesives. We're over predicting the temperature, and we're under predicting at the end. But right now, we're working on this, and this is a very good first cut for these experiments as I try to dig deeper into why we were not exactly matching. Although I, I feared it would be order of magnitude off when we, when we do this. And so the fact that we're only 10% off is really good news for, for me. OK, so then we shot a DU disk. Now, this is our first test in a double-walled containment to make sure that nothing leaks out. So we have secondary containment, or primary containment, secondary containment, and then just the cavity itself. Here's a cutaway of our model that I believe Alex made this. So this is cut in half. You see the DU disk in the middle. This is our mercury model of the containment. And so I threw this into our simulation. Now I don't have simulation data to show you for the rest of these experiments, because right now I'm working on just dealing with the experimental data. But I can show you the experimental data that we saw for this. And this was pointing to a problem in the experiment. So I have five different thermocouples on the back of the DU disk. I also have a thermocouple on the aluminum on the side. And the one thing you can notice here is that they're all different. But if you look at this picture, you'd expect that those four that are surrounded in the center one would give you the same answer. So this was kind of worrisome. Um, the thought here is, like I, meant, like I said earlier, these thermocouples are touching the back surface, but they're in this kind of cup for the tip. And we don't think that the bimetal for the thermocouple is well adhered to that cup. So we think there's a difference in con contact conductance for each of these individual thermocouples, which means that if we're trying to model this, we'll get different answers depending on how we want to set the contact conductance contact conductance for the thermocouples. So that's why we're trying to do tabletop measurements now and redesign the thermocouples. These are thermocouples we bought online from I forgot which company. They're meant for circuit boards. And uh, circuit boards tend to have a long time where you can measure the heat. When, when you have milliseconds to measure the heat, you need to make sure that your contact conductance and you understand those thermocouples really well. So we're going to redesign these thermocouples this year to hopefully have consistent contact conductance that we understand, so that we would expect that these four thermocouples around the center would actually get a similar result. The one difference that I do expect is this blue one. It looks like it's peaking at a later time. If I go to the later time behavior, you see that a little bit better. So the center one is peaking a little bit later than the corners. That I would believe, because the corners are losing heat a lot faster to the edge than the center. So it should have a slightly different peaking time. I won't 100% know that until I start doing some simulations to see if that's what is actually occurring. But that's one interesting feature when we first shot this uh, depleted uranium. So 
The last experiment we ended up doing back in September, which is a stack up. So the idea here is we want to create a pseudo one-dimensional heat flow that's more complicated than a single disk, single disk, to really understand countercodes handlings. So what we have here is a stack of four materials that we clamp together. We have the initial plate, which is a two millimeter thick DU disk, followed by a two millimeter plate of aluminum, five millimeters of graphite, and then another disk of depleted uranium. We then drilled holes in the back of these disks to certain depths so that we could have thermocouples touching the back of the surfaces, except for the center one where we drilled halfway through that first uh, DU sample and put a thermocouple there. The tricky part about this, which we need to correct in the future, is I don't know how many of you have ever actually worked with uranium metal, but uranium metal oxidizes very fast. And so maintaining the clean metal surface while we're doing, while we're putting it into this vacuum vessel and backfilling it is tricky. Uh, when I was watching it for this experiment, I could already start seeing the first oxidation layer forming, which is a nice purple color. So I kind of want to avoid that um, as much as possible in the future because if there's an oxidation layer, what's that thermocouple actually touching? Is it touching the uranium oxide? Is it touching the uranium metal? That complicates things. So what do we get when we actually shoot this? We get interesting, more complicated behavior. So the blue is the center one in that front disc. You see it gets to the highest temperature, which is good. Um, you then have the red and the orange, which is the back of the DU samples reaching the next highest temperature. So although the orange is dying off faster than the red, which is on the back surface of one. And then you have the slow heat uh, temperature rise in both the aluminum and the graphite as the, as the heat's flowing out of the depleted uranium into the other samples. Uh, oh yeah, here you can actually see this little blip here. That's the initial noise that happens during the pulse into the cabling, which we're trying to investigate. That's tricky because it happens right during the pulse. It has a height that doesn't seem to correlate with anything. And sometimes it's negative. So we really need to understand what's going on there. Luckily, it disappears almost immediately, and then you get the late time behavior from the thermocouples. But what I really like about this measurement, and I was really excited about when I saw the data, was with this orange plot right here. So if I go to the later time, we can see this. The orange goes up, heats up, so it's cooling down as the heat flows into the graphite, and then it has this extra peak right there. As the heat that's moving from the front goes back into that depleted uranium. And that complex behavior is what I wanted to have happen for this experiment because I want to know if Diablo can, can mimic this at all. Right now, we have the issue of the complex inductance, and so we don't know exactly the right height that we'll get for these thermocouples, but can I match that shape? And that's the next step right now as I'm designing our future experiments for this year is trying to get Diablo to match that shape and incorporate even more complicated one-dimensional designs to really stress our codes to see how well they're doing because in the future we'll be throwing in more complicated material and we want to understand, do we understand easy material like depleted uranium before we start writing more complicated things. Now, a lot's been learned over these this year alone. We've had four weeks of successful, successful experiments. However, like I pointed out here, there are issues with the experiments that we have to further understand, which is why we'll be doing tabletop experiments and redesigning these thermocouples. Uh, experiments, I don't know how many of your experimentalists, they never go right. So I wasn't surprised by some of the data. And you can kind of see, let me go back here. There's another issue I don't mention, which is a little bit trickier. You see some movement over here in the thermocouples. So I have a theory of what that is, which is a little bit harder to work with. That timing of that movement is, is roughly the timing in the reactor where they do the rod drop after they pop the rods. They hold them for a certain amount of time, they drop them. That could cause vibrations. Thermocouples that are touching the back surface don't like vibrations. So some of that noise and jitter could be due to that fact. Due to that fact. So there's another issue that we have to look at to try to correct. Although that one's going to be harder because the reactor has to hold and do a rod drop, so I don't, we, we may have to hold for less time. So we have to do these tabletop experiments and we have to prepare for more experiments this year. So we'll be doing more single disk experiments, more stack up experiments, 
And now comes the fun part where we have to modify the vessel. So we'll be putting fissile material into this reactor. Uh, there are rules that we can put into the reactor, and one of them is to make sure that we lower the amount of thermal neutrons that get into the container. So we have to put uh, borated uh, flex boron around it to limit how many thermal neutrons we put in there. Because the plan right now is about nine months for that stack up. I'm going to take away that front disk of uh, DU and replace it with HEDU and have a really intense heat source at the front and see how well our code deals with that situation. We have much more asymmetric heating of that sample. Uh, luckily for HEDU, we have to make sure we control the pulse energy because according to my simulations, you can vaporize HEDU in the reactor if you're not careful. So it's a pretty powerful reactor. We need to make sure we don't do that because that will not be a good day. Um, before I go into the kind of the question section, I have an ulterior motive here because I have a bunch of the first year grad students. Let's see if this works. Okay, so I'm at Livermore. There is a summer internship program that I happen to be in charge of, the HEDP summer internship program. This is run out of my division alone. There are a lot of other summer internships at the lab. I run this one through the Design Physics and WCI. It's a three month long summer internship. We accept both undergrads and graduate students of any year. Uh, well, usually we don't accept freshmen and undergrads. Sometimes we do. Um, there's many areas of research. It's pretty much if you do anything related to science, we accept you. Um, applications are due in January. We have job posting on a website. I've had a lot of students from Berkeley over the years. Alex has been a student for three summers. Uh, Mario Ortega, Peter Lohr. But it's a great program. It pays really well. If you're interested in a possible internship at the lab, this is something you can do. This is a good stepping stone if you want to have possible future employment at the lab. We like using this for recruitment in the future. So it's good to get to learn what we do, meet people at the lab, work with staff scientists, always great on your CV. Uh, so if you're interested, I have some flyers up here. You can talk to me after two and, and if you have questions about this program. And before I end, I want to show you one of the summer projects we had from two years ago. Uh, we had a summer student working on the Mercury Code, doing something a little bit different. And once that summer student left, one of the staff scientists in the Mercury Code picked it up. So with that, I'll go to my question slide, and you'll see what they did with both the reactor and the NIF model in Mercury. We have virtual reality for Mercury. I don't think MCP has virtual reality. But you can actually enter into the reactor and kind of play around in there. There's actual physics in here. I don't have the package in the reactor, but you can pick up the package and like throw it. Um, you can go in there. I, I, I've been telling the code team what they have to add is the particle files so that while you're in the reactor, you can see the neutrons and, and photons flying by. That should be very easy, I said. So we'll see in the future if they do that. But this is going into one of the rods. And then they leave the reactor, and this is the Mercury model for NIF, National Emission Facility, our giant laser that does 1.8 megajoules of laser energy into a DT target to make that fusion, lots of neutrons. I think the current number of neutrons they've gotten there has been 10 to the 16th neutrons at that center of the hull rung. So now we're kind of at the bottom of the reactor, or the bottom of the NIF building, and they go up into the actual capsule which I think is the coolest part of this video, because it's an interesting capsule with a handle of Let's see. Yeah. And then you enter the capsule and you can see the inside of the thing. Which is kind of crazy when you have the VR goggles on. It's <laughs> disconcerting. Disconcerting. Uh, so, with that, anyone have any questions about the experiments or the summer program, anything at all? So we're looking into that now. Um, we're worried about having the IR sensor in the reactor. We, we don't know what will happen. Um, the plan right now is our ne next set of experiments are in April. We want to field an IR sensor to see what happens. We also have experiments we're planning on doing at NIF too, so maybe that'll work there too. We don't know. Uh, we're just trying to throw every detector we can 
uh, strain gauges, we want to measure, we want to use strain gauges to measure the, the change in the structure. Those don't always work so well, so we may want to use lasers, because we're a little more like using lasers. And then I worry about the laser in the reactor, because now you have neutrons hitting the fiber, which can change the um, index of refraction of the fiber, and that would change the laser. So it, it's a hard problem to solve. Yes. You mentioned the advantages of mercury over MCMP. Is mercury available to folks outside of Livermore? Sort of. Um, yes, you can run mercury, but you have to run it on our machines. Oh. So you become a collaborator with Livermore, and you can always run it on our clusters, which is nice because we have a lot of nodes anyway, so it's easier than trying to run on your laptop. Other questions? So, Matt? The simulation that you showed, does that like couple mercury to Diablo? No, so, so I don't couple mercury to Diablo. I do the energy deposition, and then in Diablo, I give it a time profile for that energy deposition. That is the pulse. The nice thing is that because the, there shouldn't be that much of a coupling occurring between the heating and that diffusion, so it should be fine without having to couple, but I know it's been coupled in the past. I haven't seen it do it recently. And the shape of the pulse come from? Shape of the pulse, so we have um, diamond detectors that are placed next to the sample. And so those are very fast detectors for measuring neutrons. And we, we have, a, actually I have a picture. Pulse, yeah, so we can measure the pulse really well. This is a fast pulse, this is a slow pulse. Um, the interesting thing is there's a shoulder here that's actually a lot of energy, um, especially for the high energy pulses. But it's a very quick pulse. It's a lot, lot of time. So this is kind of the pulse they use. I had a general question about the reactor. What is it used for now? What's the main part of it right now? The reactor is used by the national labs, mostly for certifying different materials, components. So it's pretty much just used by Sandia, Los Alamos. Only pulse mode or also in steady state? They can use steady state mode. It's not that common. I think steady state, they can go up to four megawatts steady state for yeah, how long. Um, but I've never seen anyone use a steady state yet. Yeah, it's possible. If not, let's thank Perry. <laughs> and if you are interested in the internship program. Yes, I have pamphlets. Yep. Also I'm a graduating student, I also have pamphlets for jobs. <laughs>